All right, this is InfoSec Decoded, and we're starting with Caitlin, who has got a bunch of stolen iPods. Again, yes. So there were a bunch of iPods that were sent to schools, and they were earmarked for Native American students. And a school employee stole 3,000 of them, according to The Verge, uh, by, and this article is written by Sean Hollister, AKA Starfire 2258. And we've actually seen his articles before on this channel. And so what happened? So there was a, um, uh, this person, she ran a, a program teaching uh, Native Americans how to read and they had iPods to do that. And apparently this person made over $800,000 from essentially taking these uh, iPods and then selling it. And apparently the way it worked is that there was somebody, I, I forget off the top of my head who it was. It was a, um, uh, uh, I think it was, his name was uh, uh, Kuta, uh, Kukta. Uh, basically what, what, what this person would do was they would like steal packages from like FedEx trailers, you know, try to figure out which ones or yeah, FedEx, from FedEx packages, try to figure out which ones might contain high value items and then try to sell it on like the, dark, the black market here in the United States. And it seems like this person did not really cover their tracks very well. Like it was all just very, I mean, it, it just wasn't a professional organization. Uh, it, I mean, it, it occurs to me if you were really good at this and you really covered your tracks, like if you, for example, were to sell these iPods in another country instead of just next door in, the, in your county, uh, they probably would have gone away, gotten away with this, but they were just kind of sloppy and kind of an amateurish operation. So, sounds like they were just sitting around unused. What good is an iPod for teaching reading? It just makes sound, right? Uh, no. So those these iPods are pretty much like small iPhones without oh. 3G or 4G or 5G, whatever we're on now. One of the Gs. Oh, okay, so it makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, I mean they're. I mean, ideally they should if they should be getting iPads or um, Kindles or something, yeah. Kindles or something, but of course, these these our schools are underfunded, and they somehow just got iPods instead. So the students are going to get iPods, but yeah, that. Well, no, you the students there's... don't get iPods. the The person almost made a million dollars stealing them, but is now in jail. So, well, you know, there's rooms full of junk we bought at the college that's sitting unused. <laughs> this has to happen. It, and all that junk throw it my way. I swear to God, I cannot have enough raspberry pies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the raspberry pies are useful, but there's anyway. Um, all right. So anyway, I got a bunch of COVID articles that I thought were interesting. Um, the way we're doing it now, we get more booster shots of the same old COVID that was designed like the four alpha variant. And they say, you know, we're beginning to reach the limit of how much good you get out of those old out of date vaccines. By March, we should have new vaccines updated to Omicron, which might be more effective. And uh, there's a, a, in you know, New York City opened their schools. The mayor is real strict. And a student posted a Reddit thread about, he said, this is just garbage. Everybody is sick. Because the teachers don't show up because they're sick, they cram all the students in the study hall, which completely violates social distancing. We're clammed in like sardines, 10 classes just sitting in study hall. And then they pass around tests and somebody tests positive and everybody runs away from them like a zombie movie, trying to get social distance in this crowd. They say, it's just getting worse. This is just ridiculous. Nobody learns anything. Um, you're just fooling yourself, pretending to have schools open with COVID exploding like it is. And uh, there are a bunch of fake COVID testing centers. Uh, a company opened up in Portland. And when you go take a COVID test, they just throw it in a bucket on the floor, leave it in the bucket all day. Don't test it at all and just send you an email and saying you're clean. And someone, woman like returned and verified this. Her test was still sitting in the bucket after she got the email. They're not doing any real tests at all. And in San Francisco, there's another unlicensed uh, company testing people, trying to cover the fact that they don't really know what they're doing, or at least they're not properly authorized. And the last one got my attention. Um, cannabis oil apparently is effective at preventing COVID. It's like the new ivermectin. And uh, it's not the weed that gets you high, it's the other stuff, the hemp seed. So I went to Whole Food and got some hemp seed. Apparently, if you eat that stuff, hemp seed or hemp oil, hemp oil one of those things, it will, it will protect you more against COVID and help treat it if you get it, they say. Although this needs to be verified. And what they say, of course, 
uh, rather than just eating hemp supplements, probably the best thing is to further refine this and turn it into a drug containing the effective uh, cannabinoid compounds that have this effect of repelling COVID, but that sounds like it may be another useful therapy. Anyway, and then we got Max with Kazakhstan. Yes, uh, so I have a funny story. It's why I wanted to come on come on here today. Uh, did anyone, has anyone watched the uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum prices in the recent week? Yeah, they've been falling, well, they've been falling for about a month. Yep. Yeah, they've been falling pretty consistently. Uh, there was this one big dip last week then there's a pretty funny story behind uh, I, probably why that happened. So uh, a while ago, China used to be the, the largest uh, country in the world for crypto miners. Mo most of the crypto miners in the world were there. Then China cracked down on that. And then they're like, oh, uh, where do we go? So a lot of them moved to this small Middle, East, Middle Eastern country called Kazakhstan because it had low energy prices, um, made a lot of profit. And uh, great but, success. Yeah, uh, great success, uh, except they failed to take into account political instability. Um, there were riots in Kai, or uh, violent protests, I believe, in Kazakhstan uh, surrounding raises in gas prices and so the government is like okay no more internet so and at that point kazakhstan was around the second uh had the second most crypto miners in the world uh and all that just went down overnight and that hit um bitcoin ethereum um all that stuff so it'll be interesting. And now, of course, uh, Russia is coming in to quote unquote uh, keep the peace. Uh, another, per another country in Putin's pocket. Um, and I wonder what the uh, crypto miners will do now. Well, you know, supposedly when some of the miners shut down, that shouldn't affect the price, not in the long run, because the difficulty will just be adjusted. But uh... Anyway, it's, um, yeah, this is, I remember when I went to a cryptocurrency conference, a blockchain conference about five years ago at City College, I didn't even know what was happening, the blockchain conference, I went in, it was all scams, 100%. The first guy grabbed me, let me tell you what we're doing. I bought the, we got this land in some war-torn country in Central Africa, and Yahoo's moving there, and Google's moving there, everyone's going there to escape American taxes and i'm like they are i said are there like electricity and roads and airports and internet he said well we're working on all that and and that'll come and by the way we don't really have the land yet but what we need is for you to invest and i'm like are people actually buying into this but that all the pitches were like that just completely bogus crap anyway and that's the uh, cryptocurrency space there are some real projects but a ridiculous amount of scams Anyway, uh, all right, then, uh, ah, Caitlin's got Google and Sonos, which sounds pretty awful. It is awful. And this has been a, an ongoing problem with the tech industry for almost a decade now, probably, probably more than a decade, but it's become a real big issue in recent years. Uh, basically, uh, what happened is that Google apparently copied Sonos in a big way. They, they took their, their patents or copied their, their patented technology and made their own sort of speaker devices. So Sonos is a speaker company and so is Google now apparently. Uh, and so there's this article on TechCrunch by uh, Adam Massoff uh, talking about how, uh, yeah, so Google just stole Sonos's intellectual property. And if you're a small company and you steal somebody's intellectual property, you basically just get sued and go out of business and you shouldn't be doing that in the first place. But if you're big like Google, you can just use your fleet of lawyers to just be like, nope, we're just going to steal it now. It used to be that tech companies would just sort of steal, or not steal, so they, they would buy up companies that they would want their IPs from. Uh, but if you're big enough, you don't even have to do that anymore. You, you have the legal defenses to just steal, steal other people's stuff, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And the reason I bring this up is because there was another story, and we might have covered this on the news before, uh, where... Apple was the, was the big median in this case. So there was this company called uh, Tile 
and they make these little devices that you can find your stuff and and you push a button and your, your phone would ring or you go on your phone and you push a button and your, your tile rings and your tile might be attached to your keys or something. And in order to put that on the app store, um, uh, Apple required all the schematics and all the documentation about how the product works be delivered to them. So they had full inside knowledge of, of how these tiles operated. And then sure enough, Apple went along took that knowledge, took that data and created uh, air tags. And, you know, there's very little that that company can do about it. I mean, Apple's just too big. They can't sue them. They can't, you know, reclaim their, their property. Um, Apple's just too big. They, they have too many lawyers. They basically control the system. Um, and this is what it's coming to. No longer do tech companies or at least large tech, tech companies have to buy up competition they want to acquire. Uh, they can just steal it now. Uh, and that's apparently what's going on. Well, I think it's been going on a long time. Microsoft used to do this all the time. And Apple's been doing it in the App Store for a decade or more, where they will approve your app just long enough to clone it and then kick you out. Yep. So, yeah, like I said, this is, this, is not, this is not something that's happened since the beginning of the industry, but it is something that's wrapped up in the past 10 years or so. Um, there's always been some sort of like copying stuff. It, it, most famously, like... Um, Mac OS, the original Mac OS was of course a copy of uh, Bell Labs operating system, you know, but it, was, it wasn't a pure copy. I mean, they did their own work, they didn't steal the IP. But nowadays companies are just outright stealing IPs and they're just too big to, to do anything about it, so. Well, this is why you need the government to enforce like uh, monopoly power. All right, call me. Yeah, that's that's uh, Elizabeth Warren is the one that will supposedly do something about that. All right, comrade, let's uh, let's get this done. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's <laughs> going to happen. Anyway, um, so there's been this story all over the Rachel Maddow and other shows for a while that um, there are these forged elector documents that the Republicans sent out as part of the attempt by Trump to perform a coup. They made fake documents and they signed them and they submitted them to the official channels. So there's written evidence of who did it. And apparently the uh, January 6th committee is actually looking into it and hopefully there'll be some actual prosecutions for it. And that might happen because the big surprise yesterday, they actually charged the Oath Keepers with seditious conspiracy. And that means they are, you know, I thought um, Merrick Garland was just doing absolutely nothing, but apparently he is doing something to the organizers of the coup. And that would be good. So we'll see what comes of it. The other thing I saw go by, which I thought was pretty interesting, is the proposal that we have a Biden-Cheney ticket. In Israel, everybody hated Netanyahu, and it got to the point where the far left and the far right said, well, we hate each other, but we both hate Netanyahu even more. So they made a coalition between the far left and the far right to get rid of Netanyahu. And I think it would be logical for the same thing to happen in America. Republicans and Democrats agree about absolutely nothing except we all hate Trump. So we need the far left and the far right to unite just to get rid of Trump. I think that would be awesome, but I don't know if it's going to happen. But I'd rather see Cheney than Kamala Harris as the vice president. I think that would be pretty great. Anyway. Wait, um, haven't they already gotten rid of Trump? Or will well, that back? was the problem. We <laughs> thought we got rid of Trump, but it's like that monster movie where the guy comes back even after he gets an axe in his head. He just won't die. I mean, impeached twice and he lost the election, expected him to just retire and go play golf. But no, he won't die. He keeps coming back. And apparently, so, you know, we'll see if all these uh, legal challenges make a difference, but I think he'll skate through all that. He could very well be president again. Anyway, all right, and then Max, you got a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I thought this was really cool when I saw it. Uh, so uh, some researchers were able to get a Raspberry Pi to detect malware using electromagnetic waves. Uh, I've only really heard this approach taken once before in uh, the tech industry. Basically, the way it works is uh, the Raspberry Pi has um, a module that can scan electromagnetic waves, and of course, um, the computer CPU gives off electromagnetic waves based on what's going on in the registers there. Um, so what they did is they set up, it looks like they set up a machine lear learning algorithm 
and then hooked it up to a machine that would run uh, clean regular file, regular programs, and then it would run malware and tell the Raspberry Pi which one was which. And once that was built up, they tested it and it was able to identify malware with an accuracy as high as 99.82%. Uh, malware creates different radio waves? I think what it has to do is, um, it has to do with the pattern of radio waves. Like I could believe if it was like a cryptocurrency miner or something, it would be different. Yeah. Yeah, like one, one popular side channel attack is to look at the power consumption, just read off the amps, you know, being drawn. Um, and that will also create uh, electromagnetic waves, um, not on the CPU, but just in the, the traces and the, the wires going to the system. And you can use that to determine like how much, you know, power is being um, used by the CPU. And if something is being using the CPU a lot, like a crypto miner, you could easily detect that, but you would have to be very close to the machine um, and you would have to be, you know, um, it would have to be pretty obvious. I have no idea how you would detect something like a reverse shell uh, yeah. from. That's what I was thinking. You know, I mean, ransomware or crypto miners, I could believe it. But something like a reverse shell or a key logger, it's hard to understand how that would make a different signature. But I suppose yeah. it might. I mean, full disclosure, I didn't read the research paper and get yeah, yeah. into it. And but. Yeah, it seemed I'd like to know how what, what it's kind of looking at. Like, is it a, is it detecting ransomware or is it detecting those uh, key loggers? Well, the one thing I like is it's a lot different than our other anti malware that looks for the patterns in the bytes, and so it's a second look at it that people who evade one might not be able to evade the other. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And and I do like the idea of just sort of monitoring, you know, power draw or, you know, kind of taking a baseline. Um, not snapshot, but, you know, sort of what's it doing with the raw inputs and outputs normally with the system and then compare that to something running malware and not just looking at network traffic, but also, you know, power usage, um, you know, how much data is going between the CPU and the RAM and just creating averages and then, you know, just getting more metrics out there to see if there's anything odd going on. And I think that electromagnetic waves is probably the the worst way to do this. I think if something's generating um, electromagnetic waves in the system, there are better ways to quantize what's going on. Um, like, uh, like most of the radio waves are not coming from the CPU itself. Um, it's gonna be coming from like the traces. It's gonna be coming from um, uh, power lines, cables. Uh, your monitor, for example, it is entirely possible to take like a VGA monitor, get a SDR close enough to it and then recreate the image on the screen to a certain extent. Um, and so being able to sort of tap into like the traces on the motherboard, uh, you could create a sort of like a system profile uh, and sort of get a baseline of what normally happens on the system, what happens during high loads, low loads, and then look for changes over time and then feed that into like AI. Uh, I mean, that could be another way to, to look for malware. But then again, you know, an update to the operating system could completely mess up your, your metrics. So, yeah, well, I, I like the idea of anomaly detection. It does make sense. Just look for anything funny going on on the machine. Kalen, it sounds like you should do a project of your own here. I, I, I should if I had time. My gosh. <laughs> yeah. well, this is, this is a, a thing I've noticed. We live in a wonderful place where there's so many good things to do. We can't do them all. This is a pretty good thing. That's a good point. Yeah. There's a time when I couldn't find anything good to do, and that was worse. This is better. And thing is too, once you, once, if I've had this idea, someone else had the idea before, written up many papers about it, <laughs> maybe they didn't get published in the mainstream news, that kind of tends to be a little hit or miss, but you know, I'm sure someone's looked into this before. So. You know, I used to think that, and I changed my mind. Many things you think of, nobody else has done it yet. Anyway, um, so Caitlin's got, ah, the Omicron vaccine coming in March, good. Yeah, so as you mentioned earlier, Sam, yeah. we can't keep using the same vaccines over and over again. Yeah. And so Pfizer is targeting new vaccines toward the Omicron variant. Uh, actually, I'm going to say Omicron because I like Omicron more than Omicron. Omicron is the English version of Omicron. Omicron is how we say it in America. Well, it's Greek, like right? We could find out what the Greeks say. 
I'm sure we could, but in, in general, I mean, there's, there's been some discussion about is it Omicron or Omicron? I've always said Omicron because that's the general pronunciation in America, but I noticed more Americans recently saying Omicron. Well, I've noticed um, most of them say Omicron, like the president. Oh, my, like Omicron. My friends Which is like George, it... George Bush with his nuclear. Yes. <laughs> my, my friends actually call it the Decepticon virus. There yes. you go. Yeah, Decepticon. I, I like that one, yeah. Um, so... Uh, I'm going to call it Omicron. Just to be clear, this is an intentional <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, you, know, you know the origin of the word? I mean, it's Greek. Um, no, no, but there's there's two. There's Omega and Omicro. It's the big O and little O. Yeah. Pretty, well, I didn't know that. I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's the end of the alphabet in Greek. Uh, omega is the end. Anyway, uh, not, not Z um, or Z. Uh, like that's in, what we have to look forward to is the Omega virus. Yes, yes. That's the Omega what I'm virus. for. That will be the big one. Okay. Anyway, so <laughs> now that we're done talking about uh, Omicron, uh, the history of the Greek letter, um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the new vaccines that are coming out. So Pfizer has said, yeah, we can't keep pushing out the same ones, so we're going to push out new ones. And apparently this article, according to CBS News and Megan uh, Cerullo, uh, talks about how the idea is to every 300... Uh, to get a new product out after 100 days. So the original variant of, of the vaccine took about a year to fully get to market. Uh, that was because it was an untested idea. Uh, they had to go through you know, various testing, but fabricating it was very quick. Um, essentially, we have 3D printers of a sort uh, that can produce chains of RNA, uh, which is what the vaccine is essentially made by. And you can easily update the code uh, or the machines to print out new vaccines uh, based on new variants. Um, and the idea is to uh, perhaps get new vaccines out on the market after 100 days of being first developed. So that will be a huge boon to our, our efforts in eliminating any new strains that pop up and a huge, a, a, a giant leap forward in vaccine technology. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, this one I got as a Twitter thread, which I thought was amazing. They went in Los Angeles. This guy had a police scanner and he kept hearing about train burglaries. So he went down to the train station and the containers that come off the container ships are loaded on trains. And when the train slows down, people jump up on the train and cut the lock and open it and just start stealing the packages. And he said one in every five containers is torn open this way. And the ground is just littered with thousands of Amazon shipping packages. People learn how to quickly trace through them and find the ones that have valuable objects and just throw the rest on the ground. And he found them and tracked the packages and found out they're marked mysteriously delayed in transit. An enormous amount of the shipping is just ripped off there. And the police show up, the local... Uh, Train police show up, but they aren't very effective at stopping it. It's pretty spectacular. It kind of reminds me of the streets in San Francisco where everybody breaks in cars so much that the ground is just completely covered with broken windshield glass. Um, just amazing to see the amount of theft going on. So what I don't get is that most shipping containers come with very specialized locks that are very hard to both you know, cut open and um, uh, pick. So according how are they getting in guy, so fast? According to this guy, one in five of them is just hanging open. So they have found some way to defeat it or else a bunch of the shipping containers are just old and not very well locked or something. Yeah. Anyway, and Max has got parking meters. Oh, yeah. Um, for everyone that lives in the city, uh, watch out there. Uh, if you see a QR code slapped on the side of a parking meter, it could lead to a, it could be a phishing link. Um, some of these have been popping up in Austin, Texas. Uh, some someone just came by, slapped a QR code on these parking meters. It said that takes to a website that says, "Pay for parking here. Enter your credit card information." And you enter that, and it doesn't go to the city. <laughs> That's and pretty brilliant, actually. I think it was. I thought it was pretty brilliant. Like. I would honestly fall for that baby. Yeah. Uh, Especially if I, I was in a hurry. Yeah. I don't, cause I don't live in the city. I don't really know what they do around there. So. 
Oh, it's just the city thing. Well, the main thing I learned when I moved to the city is that no matter what you do, you get a ticket. There's like four different ways to be wrong. <laughs> you can pay the meter and then it says no parking on Tuesday. And then you can, then it says no parking from here to the corner. And then it says, it turned, I kept getting tickets when I thought I'd done the right thing. You have to read all kinds of signs and find many different wrong things you can do. Anyway, and the last one I thought was pretty interesting, um, stingray attacks. However, you do a man in the middle attack, the police rely on it and a bunch of amateurs do it, although it's highly illegal. And now you can finally stop it. Stingray attacks rely on downgrading your phone all the way back to 2G. All later techniques are end-to-end -end encrypted in various ways that prevent this, but there's been no way to turn off the 2G on your Android phone until the very latest version. Now there's finally a way to turn it off. So um, I don't know why you'd need it turned on unless you're traveling to some country that's still using 2G, which I imagine there aren't very many of them. Anyway, and I don't know about iPhones. I don't know if you can turn it off, but uh, it is possible. It's not the default, but it is possible to turn off the 2G on your Android phone, and then you'll no longer be susceptible to this simple form of, of interception. So that's a good thing. All right, and that's it for this one. We'll be back on Tuesday.